and minimize you guys. Okay, so thank you. So first of all, thank you to the organizers for inviting me and thank you to all the uh, previous presenters. This has just been a terrific day, very, very energizing. So uh, I will get onto it. So these are my disclosures. And uh, so these are the four topics that I'm gonna cover today. I'm going to uh, share my perspective on a promising approach for closing the gap between health-related research and clinical practice. And that approach emphasizes scientific and systems engineering efforts equally. Uh, I'm going to describe NIMH's success in implementing learning healthcare for first episode psychosis, and also talk about our plans to expand this model to address the needs of youth at high clinical risk for psychosis. So I wanna start by um, just pointing out that the US Department of Health and Human Services include, includes eight public health service agencies. And one of them is the National Institutes of Health, uh, which supports research that uh, is designed, uh, intended to enhance the health of all people living in, uh, in America, in the United States. And among those institutes, uh, the National Institute of Mental Health has a very specific role uh, to support science that will improve our understanding of mental illness, to help us develop uh, better uh, interventions, both treatment and preventive, uh, with the goal of uh, deploying that knowledge in the public health system uh, to bring about improvements in uh, public mental health. So we do have a, a, a focus on moving science into practice. For the past 15 years, uh, NIMH has vigorously uh, promoted implementation science to address the gap between the production of scientific findings and adoption of new approaches in clinical practice. I present this slide to remind us that we sail against strong headwinds. Uh, typically, it takes many years for a small amount of research to make its way into clinical guidelines. And it, even more disheartening is the observation that only a minority of clinicians make use of evidence-based practices. So there's a gap between what we do as scientists and what actually happens uh, in the, um, the, the clinical service system. Um, a very promising model that we've been exploring is the uh, learning health approach, was, which was first described in 2013 by the Institute of Medicine. Uh, the appealing aspect of learning healthcare is uh, it's not science to practice, but it's science in practice as a solution for being able to implement the best evidence-based care possible, to use the tools of uh, rigorous assessment and uh, uh, systematic analysis of data to measure the effectiveness of evidence-based care in real-world clinical settings, and then using that data to identify ways that we can improve services as they are delivered. And uh, then look at the results of quality improvement efforts, examine variation to see whether there are gaps in knowledge that have been revealed. And in the case that there are, to use that as a, um, uh, a stepping off point for launching new research and creating a virtuous cycle uh, by which science starts uh, a process where the best care is given. We use uh, data, uh, to inform our efforts to optimize the, uh, the evidence-based care and then uh, turn uh, uh, those, uh, the, uh, that, that experience back into the scientific process. Wh why does NIMH prioritize learning healthcare? Well, the, there are several, several reasons, three of which uh, are here on, that, on the, uh, this slide. Uh, we found first that this is a, uh, an approach that uh, promotes rapid science to practice translation. So it, it builds a system that is designed to accept scientific findings and put them into practice without long delay. By embedding standardized assessment and meaningful data analysis into routine clinical care, we can get a better idea about how treatments operate in the real world, and we can target uh, uh, efforts to improve the quality of care 
and extend the benefits of evidence-based care uh, to uh, a larger number of, of individuals. And finally, learning healthcare um, is very efficient in that, that it generates multi-purpose data that can be used by a number of stakeholders. First, by clinicians and administrators who are looking to uh, improve the quality of, of healthcare, uh, by uh, scientists who are interested in uh, practice-oriented research that would uh, improve uh, our improve the effectiveness of our care and our ability to, to deliver it effectively. And then finally, uh, generating data that would inform the process of evidence-based policymaking. So for all these reasons, uh, we've been very eager to explore uh, the principles of learning healthcare and put them into play. How did, how did we come to this conclusion that learning healthcare was uh, a very um, uh, promising approach? I'm going to tell you that story in four chapters um, that'll give you a little bit uh, of insight into recent history at, at NIMH. And the first chapter focuses on uh, an implementation strategy uh, that emphasizes an understanding of the, um, the situation in which care will be delivered and then um, understanding uh, or, or crafting uh, your intervention development around that, um, that circumstance. So it's known as deployment-focused research. And we became very interested in this approach around 2008 as we were um, looking to make um, a, uh, a study uh, that uh, would test strategies for uh, addressing first episode psychosis in the United States in community settings. Now, uh, many of you have probably heard of our effort, uh, the recovery after an initial schizophrenia episode, which was launched in 2008. And uh, RAISE was a study that had uh, some specific goals. The research questions that were addressed in RAISE really reflected this deployment-focused approach. We wanted to know if we could implement evidence-based care in community settings in the United States. So could we get science to be uh, adopted and could we make it work in real world treatment settings that weren't supported um, uh, necessarily by academic research centers, but um, were part of the US public health system. Um, so we wanted to know if it was feasible to do that. And if the answer to the first question was yes, that it was feasible, we wanted to test whether early intervention would be more effective than care that was typically uh, available in those settings. So we knew from uh, previous research that was conducted in other, other countries, Australia, the, um, the UK, uh, Canada, uh, that we, could ex we, we would expect based on those experiences that we would get a better response but we needed to know whether that uh, those findings would, um, would be replicated within the US context. And then if the answer to those first two questions was yes, we also wanted the research to explore how evidence-based services might be brought to scale so that they could be implemented broadly in the United States. We had two um, research uh, projects, the, um, the uh, signature project or the flagship project was a randomized controlled trial that was led by John Kane and his uh, colleagues, uh, Nina Schooler and Delbert Robinson. Um, I, I have to tip my hat to John. He, his team really did an incredible job in pioneering uh, a, um, a, a very well-designed and well-executed uh, comparative effectiveness trial in 34 uh, real world clinics in the United States, clinics that uh, had no academic affiliation and had no prior experience in, in offering uh, uh, evidence-based care, in this case, multi-element treatment for first episode psychosis. John uh, mobilized those 34 clinics. Uh, they recruited over 400 uh, individuals with first episode psychosis. And um, the, uh, the clinics themselves uh, were randomized to either offer this multi-component care. Uh, the, re the remaining clinics um, uh, offered uh, typical care for first episode psychosis. And uh, what John found 
uh, that after two years, a coordinated specialty care approach was superior to usual care on a number of, uh, a number of dimensions. Individuals stayed in care longer. Uh, they experienced a, a higher quality of life. They uh, achieved greater reduction in, in positive symptoms of psychosis and depression. They were more likely to be involved in work or in school. And uh, uh, at the end of the day, it was uh, shown that this approach was more cost-effective than usual care. Another important finding uh, from this study was that uh, uh, this approach worked best uh, for patients who were treated uh, who, or who were engaged in care with a shorter duration of untreated psychosis. So that was the first raised study. The second raised study was an implementation study. This was led by Lisa Dixon, Howard Goldman, uh, Jeffrey Lieberman, uh, and it, uh, it studied uh, what would be uh, barriers to implementing uh, this kind of team-based approach for first episode psychosis in public health uh, or public sector settings in the United States. Um, they, uh, they identified barriers, and importantly, they developed uh, tools and strategies to surmount those barriers and demonstrated uh, that they could uh, train teams of individuals, uh, deploy them so that they were able to offer care. Uh, and uh, importantly, this approach was so convincing to a key stakeholder, in this case, the, the state of New York, the commissioner of mental health, was so impressed with the early results from this study that New York State just went ahead and adopted this approach for statewide implementation. And subsequent um, research that uh, built on the, um, the, uh, the uh, RAISE implementation study demonstrated um, that this program could achieve effects that were very comparable to those that were achieved in the randomized controlled trial. And here, importantly, um, this study implemented, along with the treatment, the data-informed uh, approach to uh, monitoring the uh, performance of the treatment over time and giving performance feedback uh, to the uh, participating clinics to improve their effectiveness. So there was a, a, an air of excitement around 2013 and 2014 within NIMH as we were looking at results, early results from the RAISE trial, and then also looking at our other investments in early psychosis and in, in clinical, clinical high-risk uh, studies. And we began, um, to imagine, well, what would, what would happen if we wove together all these different strands of research? Would we be able to um, put them together and implement them in the public health uh, setting in a way that would improve outcomes for people uh, with, uh, with early psychosis? And what you can see here is that our end game was, was really to develop a system of care that would enable high quality early identification and intervention um, in community treatment programs throughout the, throughout the US. So we had high hopes that our RAISE study would give us uh, an initial boost, uh, followed by uh, some of the uh, work we were doing to reduce the duration of untreated psychosis. And up here in the clinical high risk space, you can see the, um, the first iteration of AMP schizophrenia that Josh Gordon mentioned earlier today uh, where the, the emphasis was on research to develop biosignature of psychosis risk states, and then move into experimental medicine studies, mechanism-based efficacy studies, and so forth, so that there would be a cascade of research that probably would take longer than our implementation studies, but would be able to be, um, they would find a home. Results would find a home in this new setting that, um, that had been uh, developed. So we were we were enthusiastic, and I, I was so enthusiastic about how Ray's was going that I thought that about half of the active treatment sites would end up offering that care long term. So we would have about ten uh, community-based treatment programs in the U.S. that were offering high-quality care, and that would be the start of uh, of our uh, building this um, uh, this new platform for care. Well, it, it turned out that um, uh, a lot of people were interested in what was happening with RAISE, and they wanted to help us uh, to be able to uh, implement those findings in a way that would have a larger impact. And I want to note here that um, a, a, a number of our uh, supporters, uh, uh, NAMI, 
One Mind, the, the APA, uh, were with us uh, in the early uh, stages of in implementing this approach for first episode psychosis. And I'm very happy that they're with us again with AMP schizophrenia. But these, these, many of these organizations were carrying the message uh, about the, uh, the opportunity and the advantages of early interventions to some of the key stakeholders in the US federal government that had a responsibility for implementing and supporting care. And most importantly, they took that message to the Congress of the United States. And uh, in 2014, the Congress was uh, impressed enough with the early results from RAISE that they um, uh, put an, an additional $25 million into the budget of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration. They allocated those funds for first episode psychosis programs, and they instructed NIMH and SAMHSA to work together to develop guidance for states regarding effective programs for first episode psychosis. That was, that was a big win. In addition to that, well, actually, what I should say is that uh, after 2014, the Congress re-issued uh, uh, or, or reaffirmed that commitment for the next two years. Uh, so we had uh, uh, additional uh, set-aside funds for first episode psychosis programming. And in 2016, they moved that uh, into uh, the authorization language, the law that uh, authorizes SAMHSA, and they made that set aside for first episode psychosis um, a, uh, an, annual, uh, an annual activity. And I'll point out between 2014 and 2021, there's been a total of, of $430 million, new dollars that went to SAMHSA, was set aside for first episode psychosis programming, and has been used to, uh, to create these new programs. So science did have an impact in these policy makers uh, in making resources available. In addition to that, I'll just notice that we work with the Center for uh, Medicare and Medicaid uh, to develop uh, some um, guidance that would allow Medicaid to, through our public um, insurance system, to support many of the, um, the elements that go into coordinated specialty care and make them uh, available to a, a large number of people in the US. So all of these things, the, the, the partners were helping to uh, create uh, opportunities. And that led us to the, the next phase where we were uh, looking to see whether we could um, take this growth that was happening and uh, incentivize learning systems that would, uh, that would follow this, uh, this growth in programs. So what, what made us interested in this is that the early, um, the early impact of that new funding was a, was a five-fold growth in the number of community clinics that uh, would offer first episode psychosis through this mental health block grant program. And you can see there were a fair number of states that signed on to this, and we had a, a total of 60 clinics. NIMH looked at that and said, well, there's an opportunity there. We also looked at um, our investments in research clinics in first episode psychosis. And we were asking ourselves the question, is there some opportunity for uh, weaving together the efforts of our researchers and these community clinic programs? And when you look at this map, there's some interesting, um, uh, interesting features here. You notice that there are some states that have community clinics, but no academic research programs. There are some states that had academic research programs, but no community clinics. And there are a small number of states that had uh, not only uh, community clinics and academic research programs, but they were working together uh, to try to um, uh, increase the, uh, the impact that was being achieved by this impl implementation of new, new services. This um, fit with the learning healthcare ideas that it's important to create a new culture of collaboration between researchers, patients, clinicians uh, to incentivize that collaboration and to achieve that through assertive leadership. So that's what NIMH took on. In 2015, we, we thought, well, maybe we can mobilize this, this ecosystem. We can bring together the researchers in the community clinics and do it in a way where they could operationalize the principles of learning healthcare uh, and, and use that to create this new, um, this new platform for treatment. 
We announced this in 2015. There was three years of bootstrapping efforts to uh, operationalize the principles of learning healthcare, to understand how they might work in early psychosis and create the framework uh, for a new initiative, which uh, we call the Early Psychosis Intervention Network or EpiNet. So three years later, uh, in two funding uh, waves in 2019 and 2020, uh, NIMH did in fact create uh, EpiNet. There are eight regional networks that uh, are characterized by an academic hub surrounded by uh, a number of community-based clinics. Uh, those hubs share a common uh, approach to early psychosis care, a commitment to uh, measurement-based treatment, data collection, and data sharing. And each of them represents a, a somewhat different experiment in learning healthcare in that uh, data are being used to uh, both improve the quality of care and to, uh, uh, to uh, support scientific uh, uh, research addressing uh, lingering questions in, in early psychosis treatment. Those efforts are brought together by a national data coordinating center, which uh, is uh, creating a, a platform for not only uh, sharing of, of resources and data uh, and analyses, but also learning with data eventually going to the NIMH National Data Archive. Uh, one of the first uh, deliverables of that uh, uh, endeavor was creating a, a core assessment battery that uh, includes 21 uh, domains that are deemed to be important in understanding first episode psychosis characteristics, interventions, and outcomes. That uh, core assessment battery is now being uh, utilized across the 101 clinics that make up the EpiNet national program. And I can say today that um, there's been uh, uh, over 3,000 individuals have been enrolled in EpiNet and uh, have baseline and uh, follow-up data uh, that are being applied both in learning healthcare and research. So uh, I mentioned there's 101 EpiNet programs, which is great. That's a large number of community-based programs. But I need to point out that that's that's a uh, there are almost twice as many uh, community programs that offer coordinated specialty care services that are not involved in EpiNet. We feel that we have a responsibility to those programs to create a pathway uh, through which research might be able to improve their, uh, their clinical care. So that uh, core assessment battery um, was designed uh, to, to uh, meet the needs of those community programs. It's available at no cost. cost. It was designed to include clinical measures that, ba that balance rigor and practicality. So it can be used in those, those programs. It's been translated in six languages uh, beyond English so that it can uh, meet the needs of many communities. And we offer flexibility to clinics in choosing which measures are most useful to them. The data serve multiple purposes, as I mentioned before. Um, uh, we, um, so, uh, what we've promised those community programs, if they adopt those uh, the core assessment battery, that they will get participant level readouts so that they can understand uh, how individual participants are prospering in uh, the early psychosis uh, treatment programs. They'll get programmatic readouts so that they can understand uh, the effectiveness of their of their programs, and they'll be able to compare in a confidential way the the um, performance of their programs against national norms that are being developed in the uh, across the 101 EpiNet uh, programs. This gives uh, benchmarks for quality improvement efforts. It also uh, provides a, a, a basis for these programs being able to participate in practice-oriented research. And as I mentioned before, uh, data that would uh, support empirical policy analysis. Um, the uh, pipelines for submitting clinical data and uh, providing the comparative feedback back to the community service programs went live in March of this year. Uh, we've had uh, the first state that actually expressed interest and joined this effort was the state of Virginia. They enrolled 12 of their community-based coordinated specialty care programs in this enterprise. So we now effectively have a ninth regional network, and importantly, um, uh, 
we 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 do not pay the state of Virginia to uh, participate. Uh, their incentive is that they get uh, these tools that allow them to uh, meet their uh, quality improvement needs, that uh, uh, providing uh, reports for their funding agencies, uh, and being able to uh, do empirical policy analysis. That's what's in it for them. So beyond that, so th this is EpiNet 1.0. Our next goal is to integrate translational research into the learning healthcare framework. And here I point out that there are a small number of translational research programs that are already a part of EpiNet, but there's a much larger number of translational research programs that are not. So we are exploring ways that we can create a, a bridge uh, between those translational research programs EpiNet, uh, the original founder networks, and then also a window in which translational researchers can get a sense of the population of people uh, receiving care for first episode psychosis in these community programs. This using the core assessment battery as a data bridge will allow those programs to um, uh, uh, perform a clinical assessments that are comparable across the whole uh, spectrum of, of EpiNet, um, EpiNet related programs. And then um, in, their, in their studies that are using the, a lot of the, uh, uh, the high uh, dimensional uh, assessment strategies to explore things like trajectories, biomarkers, mechanisms, and clinical trial, there'll be a, 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 a pathway developed by which we could expect findings from, uh, from the translational programs to be relevant uh, uh, to the community uh, community programs, that those bridges that we're we're creating are something that I think could be of great interest to uh, to AMP schizophrenia. So there are plans to extend the translational learning healthcare to clinical high risk, and one of the exciting aspects about that is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration. Uh, currently funds uh, roughly 20 clinical high risk for psychosis community programs. Uh, they have plans to expand that number, uh, perhaps doubling it. And they have asked us whether those programs could be included in EpiNet uh, in both the, um, uh, the learning healthcare and the research components. So we see for AMP schizophrenia, a way that we first may be able to uh, increase recruitment of uh, uh, of individuals into AMP schizophrenia, and also to create a landing pad by which um, AMP schizophrenia findings would be able to um, uh, be relevant to this larger community. So this is my uh, my final slide, bringing us back to this um, uh, this program of research that NIMH envisioned in 2013. We overperformed our implementation goals and we're well along to creating this learning healthcare system in early psychosis. We are creating a platform by which the, the research that comes out of ant schizophrenia will find a, um, a, a, landing, uh, a landing strip uh, and a, uh, a happy home uh, by which we'll be able to offer the best care to large numbers of individuals with early psychosis in the US. So I just want to acknowledge all the terrific researchers that are involved in EpiNet, uh, Abram Rosenblatt and Howard Goldman from the National Data Coordinating Center. Uh, I see um, there are uh, John, uh, uh, John Kane is uh, uh, one of the EpiNet uh, regional network hub leaders, uh, and then my NIMH colleagues. And I thank you. Linda, I think that's um, just about out of time. Thank you very much, Bob. That was really an impressive um, program and body of work that you and your colleagues have done at NIMH to implement this really impactful program. Thank you for the, those um, bridges that you described that will um, enable interaction and coordination between the AMP schizophrenia um, you know, research network sites and the programs that you've developed with EpiNet and the expansion of EpiNet. So it looks like a wonderful opportunity for us to explore further. And I'm glad we all got to hear about what those potential opportunities are. Does anyone else have like a question they would like to pose to Bob?
Well, thank you. Uh, it's certainly, um, I know that, that John and others have been thinking about how to, you know, actually, you know, forge some potential collaborations and interactions. So thank you for that. And we'll continue working on how best to do that. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you. Great. So.